My name is Jared Ortiz, and I teach Catholic theology in the religion department, and I'm the director of the St. Benedict Institute. And so again, just very grateful that you're all here tonight for this event, The Genesis of Gender, Christian and Feminist Perspectives on Sex and Gender. And we're honored to have the wonderful Abigail Favale with us. And I would also like to thank all of our co-sponsors for supporting tonight's event. I'd also like to thank all of the students for coming out tonight. Whether you think you're going to agree or whether you think you're going to disagree or whether you simply don't know, I am simply glad that you came tonight to listen to our speaker. So thank you. We all know that questions of sex and gender are divisive in our country and as your social media feeds tell you, also in our own community. We know that many people here tonight have divergent views on these questions. But we also know that many people here are understandably confused about what these, uh, what these terms, sex and gender, even mean today and how we are supposed to understand them and how we are supposed to understand them in the light of Christ. And that's why we invited Dr. Favale here tonight. She has been a clear and compelling voice, drawing on her extensive knowledge of feminist thought and her deep Catholic faith. And again, we know that Christians have a variety of perspectives on these questions, and at hope these perspectives can be presented. As the St. Benedict Institute, we seek to be faithful to what the Catholic Church officially teaches. And that is what will be presented tonight. So let me say a little bit about how tonight will work, and then I'll introduce our speaker. Dr. Favale will speak for about 45 minutes. After her talk, there will be time for questions and answers. Now, there are note cards going around by these two students. Maybe you can make one more tour now that everyone's seated. Uh, and if you think you might have a question, just take a note card from these ladies. Uh, and then throughout the talk, they'll go and be collecting these questions. And then through the Q&A, they'll collect these questions. Uh, why are we doing note cards? Well, if you've ever been to an event, uh, you are familiar with uh, speeches from the audience that pretend to be questions. And so we want to avoid that here tonight. Uh, but moreover, uh, we do want to guard against any insulting speech. So we want you to ask hard questions. I want to be clear about that. I wa we want you to ask hard questions of our speaker. But also let me be clear, any question that insults persons of various sexual orientations or expressions or transgender persons, any question that insults those people will not be read. And any question that insults our speaker or anyone else will not be read. So we do, we want hard, challenging questions, but we also want questions that are asked in charity and in goodwill. We also want to hear from our students first and foremost. So students, just write student at the top of your card and you'll get priority in the questions. Are people cheating already? Is that, what, <laughs> is that what that is? Oh my goodness, already, that's terrible. Uh, and lastly, and I mean this very, very, very seriously, we really do want to read your questions. So write legibly. <laughs> All right, and now our wonderful speaker. Uh, Dr. Abigail Favale is the Dean of Humanities and Professor of English at George Fox University. Uh, in the great state of Oregon. Her award-winning work has appeared in The Atlantic, First Things, Church Life, and various literary and academic journals. Her memoir, Into the Deep, An Unlikely Catholic Conversion, is truly beautiful. And it's also on sale for 20% off in the back. Uh, and Dr. Favale will sign your copy for free. Uh, so please pick up a copy of that. She also has another book, uh, which uh, the, this talk is based on, The Genesis of Gender, uh, which will be released by Ignatius Press early next year. Please help me welcome Dr. Abigail Favale. Hey 
Hey there. Thanks for being here. Um, and thank you especially to people who are here who disagree with me. Um, I'm, I'm glad you're here. And I'm glad you're here to um, hear what I have to say and to engage. Uh, so I have um, not always agreed with the things that I'm going to say tonight. Um, there have been times in my life where I very much would have disagreed with some of the things. And I know that even in those times in my life, I was very much coming from a place of goodwill. And so I think that's also important to remember that even as we, we disagree about these things that are, are that touch so deeply um, very personal parts of our lives and are so important because of how connected they are to our humanity and our identity and our relationships with others, um, that it is possible to hold differing views and still be coming from a place of goodwill. All right, so um, like Dr. Ortiz mentioned, this is, um, this is my first time giving this talk, so this is my first attempt at distilling a book of over 200 pages into a 45 minute lecture, so this is only kind of a slice of it, so necessarily will be um, kind of skipping along the surface in some ways, and so I'm, I'm hoping that nonetheless it will be, um, be interesting um, to you and give you food for thought as we, as we kind of dive into this, this complex topic. So I wanna give just a bit of a sense of my background. Um, so like Jared mentioned, um, I'm a professor and a dean at George Fox University, which I think is a, an, a Christian university a lot like Hope. Um, and I really love being in that community. I think like Hope, George Fox often finds itself kind of in the messy middle of all of, of these um, kind of culture war topics, like trying to figure out how we can still have a sense of community even as we disagree on certain things. Um, and uh, my background is in, my doctorate's in English, in feminist literary criticism, and I have a master's degree in gender studies. So um, my academic expertise and preparation is in, in feminist um, and gender theory, as well as women's literature. And I went back, let's say, around 14 years ago when I was in um, the gender studies master's degree. I remember being in this seminar, um, and this was a very secular school, a very secular environment um, in this gender studies program. And we were reading, you know, I wish I could remember exactly, it was either Derrida or Levinas, but we were reading an essay by some French philosopher, French postmodern philosopher, in which um, he, he kind of started to write as a woman. So he kind of stepped into the discursive space of being a woman and then wrote from a woman's perspective. And so we were talking about this. Um, I think we were only women in the program except for one like 60 year old guy named Tom who was like, what's happening? <laughs> you know, he was like, he was like retired and he was like, oh, I think I'll go get a master's degree in gender theory, you know? Um, and so most of the time he was just kind of like, <laughs> uh, yeah, anyway, it was wonderful. So aside from Tom, you know, we were all women in the room. And um, we were talking about our reaction. Like, is this, like, is this an okay move for Derrida or Levinas to do this, to kind of step into that space, you know? And, we were kind of talking about it and eventually we kind of concluded that, that no, like you can't just step into that space. Like there's something about embodiment that matters, right? We kind of all came to that consensus. Even though um, we were all, had different perspectives at the time, um, that, that was not a very controversial idea. But the terrain is very different now. The terrain of gender looks very different now. And so I, I suspect that um, a seminar like that, it's supposed to be blank if you're worried about it. Oh, okay. I can also like get a little more intimate with the mic here. <laughs> okay. Right. So, um, but the terrain looks different now with gender, right? So what it means to be a woman um, is a more complex question than it was 14 years ago when I was in that gender studies program. Um, so what is a woman? What is a man? Right? These are questions that are no longer as straightforward as they once seemed to be. Right? And why, is it, why are these terms so contested in our time? Why, how did we get here? Right? Just speaking in terms of the philosophical development of ideas, in a, in a history of ideas sense, how did we get here? Right? And then where do we look, especially as Christians, 
when we're trying to figure out how to navigate these difficult questions. All right, um, where should we go? So this lecture is going to explore the genesis of gender in two senses of the term. So the first part of the lecture is a more or less linear story um, about how the concept of gender developed in the last 70 years or so. And then in the second part of the lecture, I'll move into more of a side-by-side -side worldview comparison between what I call, we'll call the gender paradigm and then a, the Christian paradigm or what I call mainly for um, the purposes of alliteration, the Genesis paradigm, although I will be talking a lot about Genesis too, so it's not just alliteration. So let's start with, um, I'm gonna be like going backwards the whole time here. Okay, let's start with the gender paradigm. Um, so I wanna start with a little bit of an exercise, a little bit of interactiveness here. So just, what is gender? Just give me some definitions, all right? What is gender? Sorry, what? Okay, male or female. So gender is basically synonymous with sex. All right, there's one definition. What else we got? Okay, gender is a social expression of sex. Okay, good. Good, good. this is good. Keep going. What else? Okay, gender is a social role. All right. A social construct. That's good. Yes. Okay. Any other, any other definitions you want to toss out here? Not a binary. Not a binary. Okay. Good. Spectrum. A spectrum. It's, an it's an identity. Okay. Complex. Complex. A word in English. A word in English. <laughs> uh, all right. Okay. Okay. So we got some. We got some material here to work with. Okay. Um, so here are some of those definitions, and I put that last one in the corner that we could like fill in the blank if there are any things that aren't really captured here. Um, so we had, the, we had someone say male and female, right? So that, that's kind of the gender equals sex. Like a lot of people just use those terms interchangeably, right? Um, and then we have kind of in that cloud on the top, the, the traditional like sex gender split, right? Where sex refers to biology or femaleness or maleness, and then gender refers more to the kind of cultural trappings or the social expressions um, of sex. Um, then we have gender as a social construction or a socially compelled performance. Um, no one really said the last, the bottom two, but I often see these, um, like gender is, it's kind of an innate sense of oneself, right? Or this is kind of a different way of putting it that's a little more essentialist, like either biologically essentialist or a little more kind of spiritually essentialist, like gender is this innate, um, state of the soul or the psyche, right? So here's, here's just kind of a, a mix. And you notice that they're not all necessarily harmonious, right? So some of them are very different, right? Um, and so they, they don't necessarily cohere. And so one of the problems right now in even just talking about gender, you'll have two people, probably of goodwill, talking and using the same term but meaning totally different things by that term and talking right past each other, right? So let's go over a brief history of gender. And I'm, again, I'm going to have to be like sort of, it's, this is gonna be cursory, all right, but I, I wanna hit some of the highlights. So in the development of what I'm calling the gender paradigm, existentialist philosopher Simone de Beauvoir looms large, and that may seem strange because she didn't actually use the term gender in her work, right? Her most famous work is called the second sex, right? Not the second gender. Right, because, and that's because she really predated the usage of gender in this term. So the second sex was written in 1949, and prior to the 1950s, gender as a word was a generic term that meant category or kind. Um, so you might find references to like the feminine gender or like the feminine category of people. But it was more customary to talk about languages having gender, right, like they do in Russian or Spanish. So Simone de Beauvoir doesn't actually use the word gender. But she introduces the concept that the term gender would soon come to represent. 
And that concept is really expressed in her perhaps most famous line, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. So that statement is kind of the mustard seed of contemporary gender theory. The basic idea that she's professing here is that females are socialized into becoming women. So she does connect femaleness and womanhood, but she sees femaleness as this kind of facticity, but then females become women through socialization. So she is drawing a distinction here between the idea of woman and female and arguing that woman is more of a social and cultural fabrication that is layered onto um, the, re the reality of femaleness. So this prefigures the turn toward gender that would begin in the following decade and really take hold in the 1970s. And so the person who really popularized this idea was psychologist John Money. So John Money, he was a psychologist, like I mentioned, and he was one of the first advocates of the kind of tabula rasa interpretation of the human person. So human, human beings aren't born, we are made, right? That similar kind of idea. So he argued that biological sex had no intrinsic connection to men and women's social roles or behaviors. And he drew a distinction, distinction between sex as a mere biological fact and what he called gender. So he was the first person to really put the name gender to what Simone de Beauvoir was already describing. A social identity that's more a product of culture than nature. And so money is the person who first coined the term gender role, right? That's such a common word that we've heard, but John Money was the first one to use it. So John Money is, um, his most famous patient was a man named David Reamer. And David was brought to him as a young boy, um, an infant, still a baby after his penis was disfigured in a botched circumcision. So money, remember, he believed that, that one's gender identity was totally socially constructed. And so he told David's parents that if you, we can reassign him as a girl and raise him and it'll be fine, right? Because there is this, um, because gender is socially constructed. And so David's parents agreed and they entrusted their, their son to money's care and he was subjected to further genital surgeries and renamed Brenda and raised as a girl. Now David happened to be an identical twin. So this gave John Money um, a way to run an experiment on his theory, right? You had the control and then you had the other twin. So as part of his ongoing experiment, Money met with the twins annually throughout their childhood and his, his sessions with them were disturbing and invasive involving clear instances of what we would now see as sexual abuse. And as a teenager, David became suicidal. He rejected this female identity, and he eventually learned the truth about his birth sex from his parents. And then he underwent more surgeries to try to kind of restore his body, and he took the name David. He married, adopted some children, and it seemed like he might have been able to reclaim um, something of a life for himself, but then he killed himself in 2004, on May 4th at the age of 38, just two years after his twin brother had also committed suicide. So Money's attempt to demonstrate or prove the veracity of his theory of a human being as a blank slate failed catastrophically. His theories about the malleability of gender proved not to be only erroneous but actually fatal for his two research subjects. But unfortunately, that tragedy took decades to play out, right? I mean, David went to money in the 60s. He died in 2004, so this was a 40-year tragedy unfolding. And in the interim, money's ideas and his definition of gender absolutely took hold in the academy, especially in um, the humanities and social sciences, and certainly in feminist theory. So second wave feminists particularly latched on to the idea of gender because they saw this concept as providing a site of resistance to gender essentialism or the idea that men and women are innately different. So instead of relying on sex to classify men and women, a new paradigm was emerging that distinguished between sex as a biological reality and gender as a collection of socially constructed norms and ideals that are associated with each sex and then mistakenly read as natural. So this is the sex-gender split, the classic second-wave feminist understanding of sex and gender that I inherited when I started my feminist studies about 20 years ago. And you still hear people use um, gender and sex in, this, in, this meaning, in, in these meanings. And you can understand why this distinction was appealing to feminists, because it facilitated an important move 
um, beyond reductive and often misogynistic arguments about what it means to be a woman. So historically, appeals to women's nature or women's essence would be used to deny them certain rights and opportunities, such as access to higher education or the vote, um, those sorts of things. So without this concept of gender as distinct from sex, such ideas about women were very easily naturalized and seen as innate or inevitable rather than distortions of culture. Now with this concept of gender, feminists could better name and articulate and resist those narratives. However, in the late 1980s and 90s, and, the, and with a third wave of feminism, this neat distinction between sex and gender that I've been talking about uh, began to be challenged, thanks to the work of Judith Butler, um, a philosopher, and she's really the godmother of contemporary gender theory. So Butler ups the ante of social constructionism. So she asserts that sex itself, not just gender, is a social fabrication. So here's a quote from her book, um, Gender Trouble, right, where she's saying, female no longer appears to be a stable notion. Its meaning is as troubled and unfixed as woman. So Butler leans into many of the ideas asserted by Simone de Beauvoir in The Second Sex, taking them to new extremes. Near the end of The Second Sex, Simone de Beauvoir says, makes this statement, nothing is natural. And for Butler, that statement is a foundational premise of her philosophy. Nothing is natural. For Butler, the idea that humankind is characterized by two sexes that are biologically complementary is a social fiction rather than a matter of fact. Now the key to comprehending Judith Butler is to grasp her reliance on the postmodern philosophy of Michel Foucault. And I would argue that most inhabitants of the gender paradigm have unwittingly adopted a de facto Foucauldian worldview, inherited at least in part through trickle-down Judith Butler. So let's look at a passage from Butler's book, Undoing Gender. The question of who and what is considered real and true is apparently a question of knowledge, but it is also, as Michel Foucault makes plain, a question of power. Having or bearing truth and reality is an enormously powerful prerogative within the social world, one way that power dissimilates as ontology. Now, that's a mouthful. Gender is always, a, I mean, gender, Butler is always a mouthful. But power dissimulating as ontology. All right, I want to zoom in on that phrase. What is she saying here? Ontology refers to the philosophy of being, of what exists. So what Butler is saying here, that what we perceive to be real is actually a fiction that is created and enforced by institutional power. In this perspective, truth is suspended in air quotes as ultimately unknowable or even non-existent. All that really remains is power. Knowledge, then, is not a matter of discerning or recognizing what is true, because truth itself is a construction of power. Foucault uses the term knowledge power, with a hyphen, to encapsulate this idea, and this is a, a term picked up by Butler. So this philosophical approach leads to a particular political approach, which is strategically using language to subvert categories and then to create and shape a different kind of reality. Now this, this creates something of a paradox. So Butlerian gender theory is fundamentally anti-realist. And by that I mean that the idea of sex, gender, any of those related terms, female, man, woman, male. Butlerian gender theory rejects the ideal that those, that those words name something real. Instead, those concepts are linguistic power moves that create the illusion of something real. And yet, we regularly hear on social media, in political slogans, in activist rhetoric, in just the way people talk, um, claims about reality, right? So, like sex is a spectrum, right? Someone said that, or gender is a spectrum, right? So that's a claim about reality, right? Or trans women are women. Like that's a claim about, that's making a realist claim, all right? That's making a claim of what's real. So there's a reification turn that's happening. So to reify means to make real. So the gender paradigm depends upon a radically constructivist, anti-realist view of reality in order to dismantle categories and create new ones. But then there's a pivot, and those new categories are presented not as constructs, but as real, right? So they are reified. Now, most people who inhabit the gender paradigm are not anti-realists. They're not hardcore Butlerian gender 
anti-realists, at least not consciously. But I would argue that they have unknowingly entered a paradigm that is at root based in postmodern anti-realism. So this is an interesting situation because it brings us to almost an inverse understanding of that original second wave feminist sex gender split. Because now it's, it's common to hear the idea that sex is a construct, but gender is real. Gender is what's unchangeable, unalterable, which is almost the exact opposite. Ultimately, I would argue, the concept of gender, while it has been helpful in some ways in naming certain aspects of society and our experiences, it has also provided, it has also driven a wedge between body and identity. Sex once referred to a bodily given, a fact of nature. And in the gender paradigm, the power of the body to constitute identity is diminished. Let's leave our linear story now. And let's get deeper into the gender paradigm by way of comparison with what I'm going to call um, the Genesis paradigm. So you might be wondering, why Genesis? Why scripture at all? Well, spoiler alert, I'm a Catholic Christian and I'm arguing from a Christian perspective, so scripture matters. But why should we be turning to ancient texts to understand our 21st century situation? Like I mentioned earlier, definitions of gender make claims about anthropology and ontology. So the study of the human person and the philosophy of reality or being, about who we are and what is real. So those are not tertiary issues. Those are not issues that only affect a small part of the population. Those are issues that affect every single one of us. They are foundational to any kind of worldview one inhabits. So approaching this topic as Christians requires that we hold it up to the light of divine revelation. Scripture, and as a Catholic, I would also say the interpretive tradition of the church. So we can't answer the question of gender from outside scripture, but only really from within the worldview that scripture gives us. And I'm using spatial metaphors here, right? You can notice my language within, outside. I'm using spatial language because scripture is not first and foremost a rule book. It's not this cosmic car manual, this list of do's and don'ts. I mean, there's a little bit of that. But as a whole, scripture does not just give us rules. Scripture gives us a way of seeing, a way of seeing all that is and making judgments about what is true and what is false, what is right and what is wrong based on that way of seeing. And you have to enter into it. That's why I'm using the term paradigm. I'm not using the word ideology because I don't think that's a good word. I'm using the word paradigm, a framework of basic assumptions that shapes our understanding of the world. But why Genesis of all the Bible? Why that weird, wonderful book? Well, Genesis is our origin story. Now, in the ancient world, origin stories are not primarily about material origins, all right? That's a modern preoccupation. The ancient writers of Genesis were not concerned about the exact age of the earth, the evolution of species, right? We care about those things in our post-scientific revolution world. But ancient origin stories are about giving an account of identity and purpose. I'm also talking about Genesis because Christ himself refers back to Genesis when talking about how we should live. In the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus is questioned by the Pharisees about whether divorce is permissible, he doesn't refer back to the law. He refers back to Genesis, the very few, the first three chapters of Genesis, to the original order of creation. He appeals not to law, but to cosmology, to the sacred narratives of Genesis that give an account of our identity and purpose as human beings. So Christ is saying that th that part of Genesis still speaks the truth about who we are and about who we are created to be. So for Genesis, for Christians, I'm sorry, Genesis is our origin story, and it reveals where we come from, our ideology, who we are, our anthropology, and what we are made for, our teleology. So let's get into it. How do these two paradigms compare, specifically in their understandings of reality, 
creation, freedom, the body, language, and sexual difference. So I'm going to put a little bit of text on here. I mean, I kind of hope that maybe you guys have read Genesis. <laughs> um, but if not, here's like a tiny little like refresher. So this is from Genesis 1. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm just going to kind of let it. I'm going to take a drink, and you can just rest your eyeballs on Genesis 1 here for a minute. So who is the creator in these two paradigms? Right. We talked about the gender paradigm, where it's human beings or human beings as a group or society that constructs reality, truth, and meaning. So humans are the creators. But who is the creator in Genesis? It's God. Genesis says that there is a ground of truth, of reality, of meaning, a loving God. And moreover, that is a God who makes himself known, who desires to be in relationship with his creation. And if we have a creator, then that means that human beings are creatures. We are beings in relation to a God who made us and who in this very instant is holding us in existence. We do not come from nothing and then go to nothingness. We come from someone and then we eventually return to him. In Genesis 1, creation unfolds as an integral, interconnected whole, a cosmos. And each stage of this unfolding, each nested layer is pronounced by God as good. There's this subtle sense of momentum as the narrative builds. Each creative interval increasing in beauty and complexity and then reaching an apex with the creation of human beings who bear the image of their creator. They are not made to be slaves. They are tasked with tending the earth, filling it with life. The Genesis cosmology bestows upon human beings an exclusive kind of dignity, a dignity rooted in their roles as image bearers. And moreover, Genesis recognizes the duality of humankind, male and female. And this difference is part of the goodness of creation. And both sexes share fully in the divine image and the commission to tend the earth. And what about reality? In the gender paradigm, because human beings are the creators, reality is something that human beings make. It's a construct. And while there might be some level of biological facticity, any meaning or categorization or interpretation of that facticity is a linguistic or social man-made construct. But in Genesis, reality is a gift. There's a givenness to the world, to the nature of things, that is not created by us, but that is intrinsic to the way things are. The cosmos is orderly, it is interconnected, it is good. Reality is not under human control, but we have been entrusted with its care, not to recreate it in our own image, but to tend to it, to attend to its wholeness, its interconnectedness, and its goodness. These are the distinctive emphases of Genesis. The reality we inhabit is a divinely created order, a harmonious cosmos, and that order is good, intentionally and patiently called into being by an uncreated creator. And human beings, male and female, are endowed with unique dignity, marked by the image of their creator and entrusted with the sacred work of cultivating and tending life. So reality is not something we create, but it's something that we receive. Let's uh, flip to Genesis 2 now. I'm going to take another drink. So there are actually two cosmologies in Genesis. The first chapter describes creation from a transcendent vantage point, like a God's eye view, as if the narrator is suspended above the universe and like watching things flash into existence from afar. The second chapter of Genesis zooms way in. 
The narrator brings us down into the dust of Eden into an earthly paradise that is situated at the head of four rivers. We get like this address <laughs> for Eden. God is depicted in bodily terms, walking and talking with the first humans in a lush garden. So while the first cosmology emphasizes God's transcendence, the second cosmology emphasizes his intimacy. The second creation cuts almost immediately to the creation of the first human being. God forms the human, literally in the Hebrew it's ha-adam, the Adam, the earthling, the human. So not, not yet a proper name. From the hummus of the soil and breathes into his body, animating him with the divine breath of life. This imagery reveals an important truth about our nature. We are both earth and breath. We are both matter and spirit. We are physical creatures. Our bodies are integral to who we are. Yet we are not merely matter because God's breath enlivens each of us with an immaterial soul. And this is one of the foundational principles of a Christian anthropology, that every human being is a unity of body and soul. And there is more if we dig deeper still. So Genesis 2 emphasizes another vital principle, that the body reveals the person. Our bodies are a visible reality through which we manifest our hidden inner life. Each person's existence is entirely unrepeatable, and our unique personhood can only be made known to others through the frame of our embodiment. That makes our bodies a sacrament. Our bodies reveal the hidden reality of who we are. This sacramentality is displayed in the man's immediate rejection of the woman. They have not yet spoken. She has not verbally introduced herself, but the body speaks the truth of her identity, and this truth is immediately recognized by the man, and his reaction is joy and wonder at the revelation of a person with whom he can at last have true communion. So our bodies then serve a sacramental function by revealing and communicating a spiritual, an inward spiritual reality. In verse 18, I don't know if you noticed, but something unexpected happens. So God looks at his creation, and instead of echoing the refrain from Genesis 1, everything is good, he says the opposite words for the first time. It is not good that this human being, this earthling, is solitary, one of a kind. This human needs a counterpart, a companion. And so begins one of my favorite passages, the parade of animals. God gets busy making and molding all kinds of creatures, presenting them before the earthling to see what he would call them. And there's something comical about this imagery, right? Like here comes God with a monkey and like a gopher, you know, and a sheep. And the earthling's like, oh, gopher, but no, nah, it's not really, <laughs> not really my soulmate here. But um, So the Adam scopes it out, shakes his head, declares a name, you know, and there's this like misfit pageant that continues. But eventually God goes back to the drawing board and he puts the earthling into a deep sleep. And from his side, right, not his rib, his side, God forms the first human and then presents her before the earthling, who now in the text for the first time is called Ish, male. So John Paul II reads this sleep in the text as a sleep of non-being. So God creates that first, he takes that first human out of existence entirely and brings two new beings into existence, man and woman. So he replaces the non-sexed, solitary humanity with humanity that is differentiated into two modes of being human. And this reading um, is supported by that shift in terminology that I mentioned, right? So for the first time, the text calls the earthling a man. At last. Listen to the delight and relief in those two words, at last. He immediately recognizes in the silent declaration of her body that she is both like him, more like him than any other earthly creature, like the gopher and the monkey, but yet not like him. Right? She resembles him in their shared humanity, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, but difference, differs from him in the feminine form of her humanity. So Genesis affirms a balance of sameness and difference between the sexes. Now, most theories of gender lose this sense of balance. They veer into extremes either of uniformity, like men and women are just kind of interchangeable, or polarity, right? Like men are from Mars, women are from Venus, like 
Barbie and Ken or something. Both of those extremes lose the fruitful tension that's expressed here in Genesis between sameness and difference. The opening act of this second cosmology could be read as an origin story of sexual difference itself because that's the focus, proclaiming that our identities as men and women matter. They carry sacred significance and they occupy a prominent place in this worldview. Did you notice when I had the text up there that there are two times when the text breaks out into verse? And both of those times, which adds, it's like a, it's like a huge spotlight. It's like a textual spotlight. And both of those times are mentioning men and women, sexual difference. Genesis uniquely foregrounds the importance of the male-female relationship. And this is a relationship not of domination, but of reciprocity. There's not a hierarchy of value, no dynamic of superiority or inferiority. Sexual differentiation is not a mishap, but a cause for celebration and wonder. This difference is good, and our bodies are good, and both of these are an integral part of the created order, which is good. These two paradigms also have different understandings of the relationship between language and truth. Both of the Genesis cosmologies depict a particular relationship between language and reality. In the first account, God uses language to create the cosmos ex nihilo. He draws order and being out of nothingness with language. In the second account, the man uses language to name what God creates. Divine speech makes reality. Human speech identifies reality. In that parade of animals, the human's act of naming does not impose meaning, but recognizes meaning that objectively exists. He doesn't call the gopher Isha because he recognizes that the gopher is not like him and unlike him, right? The man recognizes, however, that the woman shares his nature, but in a modality that is distinct from his own. And he names that. He names that difference, that sameness. And as I mentioned before, it's only after that moment that the words ish and isha, man and woman, first enter the text. This is then a moment of mutual recognition. The man is both naming the woman and renaming himself because it is through encountering her nature that he is able to truly understand his own. So throughout both accounts, naming is depicted as a linguistic response to that which is being named. Reality then exists prior to our naming it. And our language is true and meaningful only when it corresponds to what is real. This understanding of language that we see in Genesis contrasts starkly with the view that dominates contemporary debates about gender. Most gender theorists hold, like I've mentioned, that we think of reality as a, what we think of as reality is a linguistic and social construction. Our use of the words woman and man, so this theory goes, create the illusion that sex is a binary. This constructivist view of language is a complete inversion of the correspondence view depicted in Genesis. In this divinely revealed origin story, our language does not project meaning onto things. Rather, meaning intrinsically exists in what God creates. And this meaning is intellig intelligible to us. We are made to be able to recognize it. And language, which I believe is a mark of God's image in us, ennobles human beings to be able to proclaim that inherent meaning. And lastly, freedom. In the gender paradigm, freedom is about pushing past limits dismantling norms, blurring boundaries. In the existentialist feminism of Simone de Beauvoir, freedom is defined as transcending our facticity, our concrete materiality as human beings, through creating our own meaning, our own projects. In the postmodern gender theory of Judith Butler, freedom means subverting any categories that are said to be natural or based in our nature. So in other words, freedom is about transgression. P freedom is transgression. But in the Genesis paradigm, freedom is belonging. Freedom is found by becoming who we are and who we were made to be. 
The Genesis narrative follows an entropic trajectory from harmony to fragmentation. The original wholeness of Eden disintegrates layer by layer into conflict and division. That's what sin is ultimately, a corruption of wholeness, an unraveling. This origin story ends in exile, and Adam and Eve, that first man, that first woman, are expelled from Eden and left to wander the earth. Could this be a vision of freedom, perhaps? Human beings no longer controlled, no longer corralled in God's garden, encumbered by God's rules, but liberated to find their own meaning, seek their own destiny. That is what freedom has become for us in our historical moment. Stripped from teleology, our ultimate purpose, freedom has been reduced to permissiveness, pushing past limits, transgressing boundaries. But in Genesis, the exile from Eden is not triumphant. It is agonizing. It is funereal. It is weighed down by the pall of death. We are confronted in our time with two divergent understandings of freedom. On the one hand, freedom according to postmodernity, which is an open-ended process of self-definition whose only limit is death. And on the other, freedom as an ever-deepening sense of belonging and wholeness, not only within oneself, but in relation to all that is. To be Christian is to regard oneself in relation to the cosmos and the cosmos in relation to God. Moreover, how we choose to relate to one of these, self, creation, God, subtly influences how we relate to all of them. I cannot truly honor creation if I do not honor my own body, which is itself a part of creation. Pope Francis emphasizes this connection in a passage from Laudato Si, which is worth quoting in its entirety. The acceptance of our bodies as God's gift is vital for welcoming and accepting the entire world as a gift from the Father and our common home. Whereas thinking that we enjoy absolute power over our own bodies turns often suddenly into thinking that we enjoy absolute power over creation. Learning to accept our body, to care for it, and to respect its fullest meaning is an essential element of any genuine human ecology. Also, Valuing one's own body in its femininity or masculinity is necessary if I'm going to be able to recognize myself in an encounter with someone who is different. In this way, we can joyfully accept the specific gifts of another man or woman, the work of God the Creator, and find mutual enrichment. It is not a healthy attitude which would seek to cancel out sexual difference because it no longer knows how to confront it. That final sentence takes a jab at the gender paradigm. Pope Francis sees that it is a disembodied concept of gender, and it ultimately erases sexual difference. Our ability to embrace the beauty of the world is connected to our ability to embrace the givenness of our own bodies. The body is a gift. That is the Christian view. Embodiment binds us to all other life, all other matter. Think of the intimacy of taking a breath, drawing the exhalation of other organisms into your lungs, borrowing a bit of their life to sustain yours. I mean, it's kind of gross to think about with the COVID pandemic happening, but nonetheless. <laughs> think of the intimacy of eating, welcoming the matter of plants and animals, absorbing it into your flesh, drawing strength and energy from the fruit of the earth. Think of the intimacy of walking, trusting in each moment that the ground will hold you up a trust so implicit it remains unthought. It is not the idealized body that is a gift, the body that's adorned with ornamental muscle, the body with long limbs and smooth skin, airbrushed to oblivion. We find the body's giftedness within its finitude, its limits and flaws, because these limits reveal to us our interdependence as human beings and awaken us to our ultimate vocation, which is to give and receive love. In all of these questions, I believe that we must consider these questions from within the scope of a Christian cosmos. We have to be attentive to the foundation, the frame, to the assumptions that are being made about reality and anthropology, and how those compare with a Christian understanding of reality and the human person. If you don't make a conscious decision 
about the worldview or paradigm that you choose to inhabit, that decision will be made for you without you realizing it. We must read gender through Genesis and Genesis through the light of Christ. A Christian approach to gender is one that seeks to move from the exile of sin and into the realm of grace, all the while remaining attentive to the voice of nature and the voice of God. This means taking Genesis seriously as a divinely revealed cosmology that describes our origin so as to give us an enduring account of our identity and purpose as human beings, especially in our maleness and femaleness. Within this redemptive order, we can recover our wonder at last. We can recognize anew the abundance of the gift, the gift of our bodies, the gift of our shared humanity, and the gift of sexual difference itself. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Favale, for that excellent talk. We have lots of questions here. If you still have some questions, feel free to give them to our students moving around. We'll get to as many as we can. There was a lot of questions about the John Money experiment, and so we just picked one of them. Uh, they were all similar. It says, Money's experiment was inherently flawed mm -hmm. and problematic for the reasons you stated. Um, it seems it couldn't be used to provide evidence for his theories. However, this doesn't mean that his theories were disproven. Do you know of any other experiments that took up this question and what the results were? Oh, no, because generally human experimentation isn't recommended, but um, I, I don't know that I would. So my main point in talking about John Money is actually not so much to evaluate his ideas, although I do think, I do think that that story and his experimentation shows that you can't just impose an identity on someone. You know, you, you can't just sort of shape, reshape someone. Like it's not purely a social construct, right? It really does push back against the idea that gender or sexual identity is a total social construct. Um, I don't really see how you could interpret it in a different way than that. But I, my, I wanted to point out with John Money that he, that he is an important figure in terms of the changing meaning of the term gender. So he was kind of the first one to begin to use that term in an entirely new way. And so you can't really talk about, in a history of ideas way, how gender has come to mean what it means today without talking about John Money and how he used gender in this way um, to name a, a, social, a socially constructed aspect of reality. Um, and I, then I think, yeah, you have to look at how it worked and didn't work, I guess, in the, in the case of, of David Remerna's brother. There are also a number of questions about intersex individuals. And so how do intersex individuals play a role in your claims? Sure. All right, so intersexuality or intersex um, that's a term that refers to, it's an umbrella term referring to various conditions of sexual development, right? So there's other terms like DSDs or CCSDs, congenital conditions of sexual development, differences in sexual development. Um, so um, intersex is a common term referring to this as well, although I think it's probably a little bit less precise than something like congenital conditions of sexual development. So sexual development is a process. Right, And in any biological process, things can unfold differently than what is expected, right? whether that's in the development of, of any organ system. right? And so sexual development is no different. So intersex is an umbrella term referring to these different conditions. But what's important to realize is that intersex is not a third sex. Intersex is not an other sex. Right? That really dehumanizes people who have conditions of sexual development because it's not as if they're exempt from the reality of sex. Rather, intersex, intersex conditions should be understood as variations within the realms of maleness and femaleness. At its basic level, sex is about 
gamete production, right? Sexual reproduction, this is true about any species, not just human species, not just animal species, any sexually reproducing species. Sex is about the production of large and small gametes, right? So human beings are sexually dimorphic species. There are only two sexes. There's no third kind of gamete, all right? But there are people who develop conditions where their sexual development as male or female presents in atypical ways. And there's a dark history of forced genital mutilation on intersex infants in order to try to make them look more normal, right? And thankfully, because of intersex activism, that's a practice that has now fallen out of the wayside, which is, which is good. So the problem with um, how we need to approach with intersex conditions is to expand our understanding of maleness and femaleness, not to throw out the idea of a sex binary altogether. One of the reasons I think we misunderstand sex is that we have lost a sense of what the unifying function or purpose of sex is, which is reproduction, the gestation of life, the production of life, the transmission of human life. So all these sexual, we talk about secondary sex characteristics, right? Like gonads, um, breast development, hip width, you know, all these secondary sex characteristics. That's not sex itself, right? So there's variations and variability in certain sex characteristics. Some people point to karyotypes, XXXY, different variations in that, in order to say that, oh, well, sex is a spectrum or sex doesn't exist. But a karyotype itself isn't sex. It's, it's basically like the genetic recipe that should spark a certain kind of sexual development process. And so sometimes the sexual development process that unfolds does not actually match the karyotype, right? So you can't just, what I'm saying is you can't just look at these different pieces in isolation, but you have to look at the organism as a whole. And I think if you look at these different levels of sexual development, these different dimensions, then sex can be discerned. And when we're talking about intersex conditions, you know, I have to say I get, I get really frustrated when the intersex card is played. Because when we're talking about people who have congenital conditions of sexual development, the really complex cases where there is genuine sexual ambiguity are so individual and so particular that the focus should be on the care that that, that individual person needs and not using that as, as existence to make some kind of political or ideological point. But the bottom line is a lot, of, a lot of conditions, so the bottom line is that intersexuality is really variations within maleness and femaleness and not an exemption from sex. All right, so that's kind of the basic thing. I could go into more detail here, but I don't wanna to go too much into the weeds. Um, but I'll just, I'll stop there. So another a good question here. The divided slides seem to imply that the definition of gender must be viewed either through the gender paradigm or the genesis paradigm, rather than being able to view it through both. Mm -hmm. Could it be possible to view it through both? Why or why not? That's a good question. I like that question. I, I think that these two paradigms, if, if you can't really inhabit two paradigms and have a coherent worldview. I think there are, in these two paradigms, some foundational, irreconcilable differences, right, which I, which I then named, right. I don't think it's possible, okay, so here, but I will say that there are things that we can learn from the gender paradigm that are true. And I believe that's one of the wonderful things about being a Christian, especially the Catholic intellectual tradition, like we get to take truth wherever we find it, right? And the same is true with Judith Butler, with Simone de Beauvoir. There are things that they say that are deeply true and meaningful and important to wrestle with and important to grapple with. So one of the things that I think is helpful, that, that point that the, the gender paradigm highlights, is the fact that language and culture and society do have a profound effect on us, right? Now where I would say, I would say the line is, is that they don't have the only effect, right? 
Like there is reality. And of course there is, like we, because we're made in the image of God, we also have this role as creators, right? But I think our creations can either harmonize with God's creation or they can try to sort of work against it, right? But it's true, language, the way we speak matters. It's true that there are social ideas that have been very damaging to women, very damaging to men. And we should be analyzing those things. We should be discussing those things. We should be listening to people's experiences. We should be wrestling with those things. And so that is something that feminist and gender theory is really valuable in providing that kind of analysis. But when I'm talking about the underlying worldview, I do think there are some incommensurable differences between a Christian worldview and a worldview that is fundamentally atheistic and anti-realist. It's a tough question here. Do you feel that queer Christians are not real? What? <laughs> no, that's a good question. Of course, of course queer question, Christians are real. One of the things that I'm, I suppose, trying to say in all this is that the gender paradigm provides a framework for interpreting experiences that are very real. And I don't think it's always a good framework. So those experiences are real. And the people who inhabit the gender paradigm, you know, that's the language I'm using, like, of course they're real. That's why I care about this. Because I care about people. But I, I really don't think, I don't think it is good for people to live at, to be at war with their own bodies, whether it's women being told they have to contracept or whatever. If there's anything that I am so passionate about, it's that our bodies matter. They're not just objects. They matter. There's a givenness and a dignity to them that I think we should respond to. And so I think that, you know, classically, if you talk about sort of classic instance, you know, cases of gender dysphoria, um, those, are, those are pretty different than a lot of what's being, um, than how it's being, how it is presenting in people in our time. And I think that's something that we should talk about. What is the best way of understanding these experiences that people are having? One thing I see that's really valuable, for example, in say the trans narrative, is a desire for a unity of body and soul, right? A desire for wholeness, a desire for the body to speak the reality of the person. Right, that desire is good. So I think we have to be willing to look for truth where it is, where it can be found, but also not to lose our foundation in the idea that our bodies matter and are the ground of our, of our personhood. And one of, my, one of the other things that I'm concerned about is if man and woman are not defined through the ground of embodiment then they tend to be defined by the very cultural stereotypes that feminists have been combating for decades. What I want is for more room in our understandings of maleness and femaleness. So that what it means to be a woman and to live out one's femininity in the world is not this caricature, but is unique to each individual. If we root gender in the body, that actually free, gives us a lot of freedom. I don't have to try to perform my femininity in a certain way. It just, it just is, right? Whether I'm changing a tire or cooking a meal, like what I'm doing in that moment is an expression of my femininity simply because of the body that I live and move through in the world. You know, in my work, I try to make everyone unhappy. And one of, the things, one of the things that I push conservatives on 
is this reactionary narrowing of gender stereotypes, right? Like the other day, uh, my dad was like, oh, you know, sorry, I shouldn't. I love my dad. <laughs> my dad was like, you know, make sure to dress your boys in blue and your girls in pink. And I was like, hmm. like, no, that's exactly the opposite. That's the part of the problem, right? We've created these narrow little boxes of what it looks like, what it means to be a girl, what it means to be a boy, what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman. And then the people who feel like they don't fit in those boxes, they're like, well, where do I go? How am I seen, right? And so those voices are pointing out that those boxes are too narrow. And that's a problem. But that doesn't mean that we should just throw out the idea of sexual embodiment as a factor of our identity. And that it is something that, it's a reality that we receive. You know, I don't, I didn't choose to be a woman. There are times when I don't really particularly like being a woman. But it's a reality I have to grapple with. I didn't decide, like, wow, I'd really like to be the kind of human being that can get pregnant. Wow, I'd really like to be the kind of human being that bleeds every month. I didn't decide that. That was, some, that was something that was given to me. But it's taken me a long time to see it as a gift. It's taken me a long time to see it as a gift and to embrace it as a gift. And if there's anything that I want, any thought that I want rattling around in your head when you walk out of here, it is simply that. Your body's a gift. And you are a human being made in the image of God. That's what I believe. I kind of want to end there because it's so beautiful. But we got lots more questions, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Can I get something well, harder then? <laughs> I mean, a drink that's harder, not a question that's harder. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it! Protestants! <laughs> All right, <clears throat> let me ask you a question. Uh, is feminism truly feminism if it's exclusive? Okay, so I'm gonna guess the subtext in that is that true, occlusive of trans people, is that the subtext of that question, right? I guess I would say, is feminism really feminism if women don't exist? Like, is feminism really feminism if it's no longer actually about the concrete realities that females experience around the world that continue to put them in a much vulnerable position compared to their male counterparts? Honestly, I think we live, we, we live, it is a luxury to pretend that those things don't matter. So yes, I do think that if woman is purely a linguistic identity, something that exists in language or appearance, then I don't think there's any point to feminism. If feminism abandons the concrete realities that females deal with worldwide, then I don't think there's any, there's any point to feminism. What is a woman? When you say trans women are women, what does women mean in that sentence? What does it mean? I have not found a satisfying answer to that. And I'm open. I mean, I tell you all, I've, I've changed my views on this stuff so much. I've disagreed with myself so much that I'm constantly thinking like, what do I have wrong? I talk to people who think differently than I do. I pray, show me where I'm wrong, okay? I'm open to being proven wrong.
I'm back on here. Okay. <clears throat> You're kind of like answering all the questions here, so now it's getting hard to find questions you haven't answered. But, um, but maybe you could actually say uh, a little more um, positively. You sort of, I think you, you touched on this in some ways in terms of the critique, but maybe you could say a little more positively uh, what are femininity and masculinity either as related to or opposed to femaleness and maleness? Mm -hmm. And then, secondary question, bonus points. Um, what does it reflect about God and his plan for humanity? All right, you might have to remind me. <laughs> I'm flagging. All right. Femininity and masculinity are sex lived out. So, I'm a I'm, I'm female human being, right? So there's my femaleness. But I'm, I'm a body that has a soul and a will and a mind. And I move through the world, I choose to do things, I do things. And everything that I do is an expression of my femininity. Because that's what it means, it's sex lived out in the world. Femininity, masculinity. I don't have to perform it by wearing makeup. You know, I, we've turned masculinity and femininity into these kind of cartoonish caricatures. And I think that we've lost sight of the beauty of diversity within masculinity and femininity that we see lived out in individual persons. So that's, in a nutshell, that's how, that's how I would define masculinity and femininity. So in other words, like it doesn't make sense so, okay, to get a little more complex, when we talk about, say, masculine women or feminine men, in that, in that usage, we're using those terms analogically. Like, I might say that, oh, that person has like a feline face. I'm not actually saying that person's a cat. I'm saying that person has some kind of facial feature that reminds me of a cat. So when I say maybe that, you know, um, a woman is masculine, well, maybe her femininity has a resemblance to perhaps what men often look like. But that doesn't mean she's not a woman. That doesn't mean she's not feminine. Like if we began to really use these terms in this way, I think there would actually be much more kind of openness and diversity in what it means to be a woman in the world and what it looks like to be a woman in the world. And I would love to see that kind of, that kind of diversity. Second part of that question, what was it? How does that relate to God's, yeah. Plan for humanity. Yeah. Oh, I don't know, that's such a huge question. What does that mean? <laughs> uh, I don't know how to answer that. I'm not sure. Like, is it your question or did you read it? No, I, I, did, I did read that one, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's a student question too, okay. so you know. That's you can't just totally try. punt on try. this. <laughs> Pull yourself right. together, you can do it. <laughs> Be a man. Oh, wait, no. Oh, wait. That, that, was, that was wrong. That was wrong, yeah. Um, so one important dimension of masculinity and femininity, I think I alluded to this when I talked about the body as a sacrament. The primary metaphor that scripture and tradition give to us to understand God's relationship to humanity is a nuptial metaphor. It's a very bodily metaphor, right? Like we have to kind of think really in bodily terms about maleness and femaleness and about how males and females play different roles in procreation. So males are the kinds of human beings who have the capacity to um, transmit life from outside of themselves, right? Whereas females are the kinds of human beings who have the capacity to generate life within that potential, right? Now that potential might not be actualized in a concrete way, right? I'm not saying you have to have a baby to be a woman. Like if you think that's what I'm saying, then you're completely misunderstanding me. But everyone has that potential. Even infertile people have that potential because the very category of infertility refers to a potential that is prevented from being actualized. If a male can't get pregnant, the doctor doesn't say, oh, you're infertile. Right? The fact that 
infertility is defined in sex-specific ways just loops back to the very point that I'm making here, which is that we have an inherent potential for generation, but in different ways, okay. So in a Catholic sacramental understanding, those different bodily realities also transmit a certain kind of spiritual reality. They serve as icons of this nuptial mystery between God and humankind. So in other words, sexual difference is part of God's self-revelation to us. And it also signals our inherent interdependence and relationality. We are made for love. We are made for communion. We are made for relationship. And sexual difference is the physical bodily sign of those things. So that's one way in which I would say. 